What? Well, I can bring it. Do you want me to bring it? Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for this, for the introduction. Okay, so I know this is CSA, and I'll be talking about PD control. Uh, but I believe that you know uh, PD control should be understood by you know, if you are applying robot, if you are using robotics, if you want to work on robotics, you know robotics is something that you have to understand. And not only that, control theory behind it is also something that you have to understand. So that's why I'll be talking about it. I will also talk about uh, some of the more recent techniques, uh, some of the more uh, recent methods that we have used for uh, walking robots, for example, using reinforcement learning. Uh, and that will be towards the end of this talk. Uh, but uh, this is my core area, so that's why, and this is my most recent result. Actually, nobody in ISC knows that I'm working on this. Nobody, including Shalab, uh, one of our collaborators. And uh, and it took me almost a year to figure this out. And this is a very theoretical result. And I, f I felt it was fitting for, uh, for a place like computer science, which values theory a lot. Uh, so that's why I'll be talking about PD control. Huh? CSA, I said. Oh, so the A. OK, OK. OK, yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Okay, so let me begin. So a quick uh, look at my background. So I have been doing walking robots since my undergraduate years. So you can see this little dancing robot, uh, which I made uh, while I was in my third year or fourth year, around the uh, fourth year actually. Uh, got a lot of things working. You know, it was actually a little dancing robot. Uh, it was more like you know I was trying to fit a sequence of moves on the robot to a song. Unfortunately, that did not work out well. So I got a sequence of moves, and then I started looking for a song that will fit to the moves. So it went the other way around. But then it was a great learning experience. And then uh, as a graduate student, I actually did get it to work. Sorry. This went. So it did work, uh, which, I, which was actually submitted to uh, Algorithmic Foundations of Robotics at Wafer. Uh, it was very interesting because uh, you know I had to learn a lot to go from here to here. right? So whenever I used to get distressed as a PhD student, as a graduate student, I would look back and look at these two videos. And then I would think, oh, OK, I am making progress. So I'm not lost after all. right? Uh, I've done a lot of work on human-inspired control uh, using human data. And then from the human data, try to get human-like walking on the robot, uh, which is this one. And it was, as it turned out, it was also very, very robust. Uh, a lot of rough terrain that you can see here. Uh, as a PhD student, you know, I slowly got into theory. Uh, uh, here is a nice example of this running robot. Uh, you can see that it's actually not running. You had to hold the torso up there, right? It was not straightforward. <laughs> well, I wanted to talk about my undergraduate work, and I wanted to bring the link to the graduate work, but actually this is very hard. Running is very, very hard. It's much harder than dancing. You know, if the dancing had a jumping sequence, then maybe it would have considered hard. But running is extremely hard. Actually, you know, this was the highlight of my thesis. Um, and here, you know, I developed this notion called ISS, Input to State Stability for Hybrid Systems, and developed controllers. So think of it as a robust controller for this type of systems, for robotic systems. Uh, so got a lot of so not every paper here you know talks about the running robot but it led me into that direction and we got some nice results as a postdoc uh, I switched streams I started working on arms and this was actually in collaboration with uh, a company called Miso Robotics they are a cooking and automation company they want their robot in the kitchen and they want it to do a lot of things that you know uh, a, a chef does. Uh, and we used a trajectory optimization there. Uh, for example, see, you want to flip a burger here, right? 
So you have a set, set of waypoints that you have to achieve. On this. So it's actually like obtaining a trajectory, right? Sequence of points on the robot. And the result of that should be flipping, right? So here we develop a trajectory and then we track the trajectory on the robot. Tracking the trajectory of the robot. And in fact, this actually got me into thinking because the low level trajectory that they had was a simple PD control law. I will get to the details as to what PD control means. How many of you are familiar with PD control? Okay, which is a good sign. So I don't have to get into great details. Okay. And the other aspect was that, you know, because it was a restaurant setting, safety was very important. So I got into safety because of that, because there were humans around the robot and uh, uh, they were a little concerned. They started getting a little concerned the moment it started doing more and more behaviors. So here, uh, as an example, so I actually uh, got this working during the transition from uh, the US to India to IAC. So here is a nice example of a drone, right? So think of it as a fence, geofence, right? The drone was supposed to be inside this region, but because of the GPS error, it's, there's an overshoot. And what you can do is to solve this, you make the constraints more conservative, right? Now, if you make the constraints more conservative, feasibility is an issue, and that's what I uh, focused on. And we use this notion called input to state safety, a robust version of uh, safety critical control on these systems. Uh, I'm currently working on reinforcement learning and imitation learning. This is actually my most recent work uh, in collaboration with uh, Shalab, of course, Shalab Bharadwaj uh, and uh, Sagar, a graduate student. Here, the goal was to insert the spec inside this hole, and the clearance is 10 microns. And uh, getting uh, this working in a robot is extremely hard because it's 10 microns. So what we did was we used expert data. So we get expert data. A human expert tries to insert it through the robot. And the goal is to use a generative model to mimic that expert data. So I will get into the details towards the end of this talk. Uh, uh, so this is the other example. So we have used reinforcement learning to get a bunch of behaviors, trotting, turning, sidestepping, and so on and so forth. OK. Yeah. For, for this one, yes. For, yes. For this one, no. So this used a simulator for training, and then on the deployment, uh, we used a, so I will get to that, actually. Uh, and the connection is actually, there's a lot of connection with PD control. It has to do with PD control, right? I've learned a lot from these experiments. Think of it as, you know, theory being developed by after observation from experiments. So I will talk about this towards the end of this talk. Uh, but let me talk about uh, PD control. Uh, more importantly, if you look at the world of real-time control and planning, control or planning, if you make a comparison between computational speed and computational complexity, linear feedback loss are very fast, right? Not at all complex. Uh, for example, tracking, right? Or going to a desired set point. So linear feedback loss can be used in a lot of these cases. And then comes optimization-based control loss. So you have an optimization problem in every time step, in every iteration. You compute this, you get the solution, you apply this solution on the system, right? And then you keep on doing this forever. And then the, comes the, the most recent one, the deep neural networks based controllers, which are also used in real time. What we have noticed is, you know, uh, these are getting less and less robust. But to be clear on what real time is, um, it's debatable. I would say, let's say one kilohertz means real time. If I can evaluate a control input in every millisecond, let's say that is real time. What we have This is pure real-time control. No offline, online. Yes, so it has to be online. Yes, 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 yes. So there are two parts to it, right? One is probably learning the set of waypoints, and then the, uh, the other one is actually tracking that, for example, or achieving that on the system. So my point is to focus on achieving that on the system. So it's a low-level control, right? Even in low level control, there are different levels, right? If I'm using a motor, then there is current, right? And then there is, so I need to feed in the right voltage so that I get the right current. Once I have the right current, then I need to figure out what torque to apply. So in order to match the torque, I need to, again, tune the current. So there are different loops towards it. So I'm referring to torque level, 
right? And then hoping that everything else is taken care of. So here, you know, because of the increase in computational power, we are seeing more and more of these being applied in real time, right? More and more optimization-based controllers. So I've done a lot of work on improving the robustness of this because there is a tendency towards decrease in loss of robustness because of this, right? And uh, a lot of these publications have focused on that a lot. So to summarize, um, I showed pre linear feedback loss, right? And I wanted to talk about why it is very, very robust. And that is actually the whole point of this talk. And what is PD or PID, proportional derivative integral? Uh, I will explain what it is exactly. But if you look at this recent survey uh, by IFAC newsletter uh, by from the industry, so PID control 91% acceptance rate. Compared to nonlinear control, 21%. Adaptive control, 8%. Anyone into game theory here? 5%, right? So these techniques have a long way to go, although obviously the prediction is that it will improve as a function of time. But there is a very good reason why this is, this is a very high acceptance rating. It's used in all of these robots. When it comes to low level control, if you want to track it, if you want to do a desired set point, it's all PD, PID control in all of these robots. So the question is, does it really work? You know, have people done some theoretical study on this? Uh, does it always work on robotic systems? Short answer is no. Long answer is for a subclass of robotic systems, and the two for a subclass of reference trajectories. It is possible to achieve it. So the goal of this talk is to understand why or where or when it works doesn't work in the system. So here is the outline of the talk. So I'll talk about uh, some existing work. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, that accuracy is subject to system that you have. Some systems. actually a good point so I am not being very precise in terms of you know tracking error what would be considered if the tracking error is less than 0 0.01 radian does that mean it works so I am actually being very subjective but uh, you know it's used in robotic systems uh, I would consider you know a 0 0.01 tracking error as something that is enough for a robotic system that's when I would say it is it works right uh, not only that, right? What is the convergence time, right? How fast should it attenuate? So maybe one second is okay, 0.5 seconds is okay, uh, or maybe one millisecond is okay. So uh, yeah, these are all, you know, I'm not really answering these questions. So it's a little unclear, I know. But the point was to say that, you know, PD control actually works in a lot of these systems. And I'll get to the details on the convergence rate and the error accuracy and all those things. Uh, so I'll get to the detail. So I'll start with the, some existing work. So I want to touch briefly on it. So let's say five minutes. Hope is that I'll be able to finish in five minutes, and then spend like twenty minutes on the main results, which is the main contribution. Thanks. Okay. So when I say robotic system, I am actually referring to this system uh, called the Euler-Lagrangian dynamics. So you have inertial matrix. You have the Coriolis centrifugal matrix. You have the gravity vector. And you have an input U, right? So think of it as a, so this is a serial manipulator. And these are some important properties. D is symmetric, positive, definite. D dot minus 2C is Q symmetric. In fact, this is these are all very useful properties. And using these properties, we can show the stability results. So what is a PD control law? Let's say I want to go to this desired set point, constant desired set point. Now, this is a PD control law. So here, KP times Q minus QD. So this is the error, right? And this is the derivative of the error, right? So that's why this is a proportional term. This is a derivative term. So this becomes a PD control. So this is model free. I'm not using the model, right? And very intuitive and very easy to implement, right? Why is it intuitive? If the error is positive, I know I have to apply a negative torque. If the error is negative, I have to apply a positive torque, right? So what kind of guarantees do we have with this controller? And we establish these guarantees by using Lyapunov functions. How many of you are aware of? Oh, yes, question. 
Q is a configuration. Q dot is the velocity. Q is the position. Joint angle, uh, or you know, if it's a prismatic joint, you know, the distance, the Cartesian position. So Q dot is the velocity of that. Uh, so how many of you are aware of Lyapunov functions? Believe a lot of you are. Maybe some of you are. Okay. So think of it as a value function if you are into uh, learning. Uh, so think of it as a storage function. So if the error is increasing, the upon a function is increasing, right? And the goal is to reduce this error to zero. In other words, the goal is to reduce the v to zero, right? If v dot is negative, so which means that v is decreasing as a function of time, uh, I know that the system is stable. In other words, the error is going to zero. So I can establish that the system is asymptotically stable if I have a Lyapunov function, right? And the goal is to obtain this Lyapunov function for the robotic system of interest. So consider a simpler system. Let's say we ignore the gravity terms and I apply a PD control law, right? Now, the goal is to achieve this, right? So in this case, X is nothing but the error and the derivative of the error. The goal is to drive error to zero, right? Now, this is a great candidate Lyapunov function. Notice that this is positive because this is kinetic energy and this is, you can think of it as a potential energy term, right? So we have a positive term and if I actually look at the derivative of this, you can actually substitute this here and show that it is less than or equal to zero. So V dot is less than or equal to zero. And with extra checks, you can actually show that V is decreasing to zero indeed, all the way. So it is asymptotically stable, right? So you have a great Lyapunov function candidate. Right? So I showed the PD control works for robotic system, right? Now extensions for more complex, like including gravity and QD as a function of time, a trajectory, right, is also straightforward. But this requires additional assumptions, like you know, boundedness on the norm of D and G, right? Boundedness on D dot and C, right? Uh, the boundedness is with the quadratic term. So if you have noticed, the dynamics is as at most quadratic in form if you take the magnitude, right? And this is the, the property, yes, question. Oh, good point. I wanted to save time, so less than or equal to zero. And then you use LaSalle's invariance principle to do this, okay. Okay, so it, this is at most quadratic in term, quadratic uh, in terms of magnitude, right? And because Lyapunov functions that we are picking is also quadratic, we can somehow make use of this property and cancel out a lot of this stuff and show that you can show, you can ensure that V dot is negative all the time. So with additional assumptions on the desired trajectory, for example, you cannot track a trajectory which is, which goes to infinity in finite time, right? So in order to have these basic checks, we have these assumptions. So with this, this is the candidate Lyapunov function, right? So all I've done is I added an extra Term, which is the cross terms, E and E dot, right? So I've included extra terms, cross terms. And in fact, this is, um, uh, this was founded by three different groups at the same time, right? in the same duration, inclusion of the cross terms. And by doing this, you can actually establish uh, boundedness. So because desired trajectory is a function of time, you cannot guarantee asymptotic, but you can show that it will converge to an ultimate bond. And the ultimate bond can be shrunk based on the gains. So this will be the key aspect of, of my work that I'm going to show, right? The goal is to show ultimate boundedness. It will eventually enter an ultimate bond, and this bond is very, very small, which means that the tracking error is small, right? Also, what is important is that the people that are involved, Arimoto, uh, his background was information theory, right? Uh, and uh, he calls himself a computer scientist. But then he started his own department, uh, robotics department, eventually. Kodichek, mathematician. So people from different disciplines have, you know, come in and try to address this problem. So this is very, very interdisciplinary. So, yeah. Oh, good point. Um, for uh, the manipulators that I showed in the figures, it is true. Uh, there are certain robots uh, where this is not satisfied. Uh, if I... I don't think I have an example here in this slide, but I can probably show it after that. So one example is uh, you have a rotational joint, and then you have a prismatic joint. And uh, I have simulation videos. If you're interested, I can show those videos, right? 
it's actually very hard to track it. This one or oh. So yeah, we would like this to be bounded all the time, including the derivatives. Yeah, yeah. I hope it's clear, right? Okay. Shall I move on? Okay. Now I'll get to the contribution. So I've taken almost 20 minutes. Okay. So what is an underactuated system? So the extension was for underactuated system. So I have a mapping matrix B. Think of it as a non-square matrix, right? So you think of it as an identity matrix with zeros padded on top. The reason is because your input dimension is smaller than the degrees of freedom, right? So you will have fewer actuators than the degrees of freedom of the robot. So this is an underactuated system. What is a hybrid underactuated system? You have continuous dynamics, which is underactuated. And when you hit the switching surface, there is a transition. So there is a continuous event and there is a discrete event. Right, and the discrete event is decided whenever you are in the switching surface. Uh, hybrid walking, bipedal walking robots are classical examples of hybrid and underactuated systems. So they are great examples. You have a continuous event, which is a swing, and there is an impact, right, which is a discrete event. So there is a jump in velocity. And in order to establish PD control uh, stability results, uh, we, we need additional assumptions. And the assumptions are due to the fact that there are certain states which are not actuated, right? So there are some uncontrolled states in the system which we have to take care of. So this is the key. We need assumptions on the uncontrolled dynamics of the system. So let's say you had zero tracking error, right? Still the robot is floating around because of underactuation. And this dynamics is called the zero dynamics, in fact. So we need to have assumptions on the zero dynamics of the system. And that's what I, I talked about in this paper uh, in Automatica, which was conditionally accepted. They take eight months to review, and then after you submit again, they, then it is eight more months, so it is almost two years. So hopefully next year it will come out, right? So at least it's provisionally accepted with the not a lot of questions asked. So I, I, I believe it should go through. Uh, but th these are all very important results, and I believe this is a very powerful result. Uh, and so let me get to the examples. So let me pick a simple example. There can be multiple, but in this case, I'm considering only one surface. So I'll take the example of the walking robot itself, right? So height of the swing foot. As soon as it hits zero, you need to do the transition. So h equal to h of x equal to zero, right? So that results in a manifold, right? Co-dimension one manifold. So that is your switching surface in this case. Okay. So let me pick a simple example to understand what really happens when you apply PD control. So you have a cart, you are applying a force, and then you have a pendulum, and uh, there is only f. There is no torque ab about the pendulum, so it is underactuated. So if you look at the equations, so you see row one corresponds to the cut dynamics, and that's why you have an F. Rho 2 corresponds to the pendulum dynamics. That's why there is a zero here, right? So no actuation. The goal is to keep this pendulum vertical, right? Now, let me pick this controller, F. So I have a proportional gain, I have a derivative gain. Notice that proportional gain here is square of the derivative gain. In fact, this is the key. You know, you should make the square of this. So epsilon and epsilon square. If you have this structure, you can actually get it to work. So this was actually one of the main contributions in the paper. So you should have a control of this form. But let's look at what really happens. So observation number one, fact number one, the gains need to be sufficiently high. So epsilon needs to be sufficiently high. So let me show three videos. So epsilon equal to five, 10, and 20, right? So let's see how epsilon equal to five goes, behaves. So it's going in the opposite direction. It was supposed to go up. Epsilon equal to 10, it's somehow able to pick itself, right? Epsilon equals 20, it's perfectly vertical, right? So it's able to work. What is important is that, you know, this gain is actually important to overcome the gravity in this case. And that was the key. If you look at the waveforms as a function of time, theta and theta dot, sorry for uh, this, it is not showing here. So the norm of this should be zero, right? So the goal is to make this go to zero. Epsilon equal to five was not enough. 
right, but the other two are going to 0. Notice these states, these are actually the 0 coordinates, uncontrolled states of the system, right. They are increasing as a function of time. You notice that the cart was actually increasing going forward, right, over time. In fact, this is what was happening, right. We are trying to keep the pendulum vertical, but the cart was going infinitely, right. So, but this is very, very important because this plays a huge role here. Uh, but then the point was, you know, to show that despite all of these, if you apply sufficiently large epsilon, you can actually bring it down to zero, right? So this is the key. And I was able to do this simply by using the structure. Other structures, I don't know. I was not able to prove. Okay. Fact number two, pendulum needs to be close to vertical. So let's consider a different initial condition. So let's say the pendulum is horizontal, right? So it's a little below horizontal. No gain is actually making it go vertical, right? You can also see it in the waveforms. Actually, increasing epsilon is throwing it farther and farther away from zero, right? And this cannot be even explained. So the devil is in the details. If you look at the equations, so let's say I split these equations. I substitute for r double dot in row two, and I get this form, right? So after doing these manipulations, you get this equation. So think of this as, you know, inertia, Coriolis, gravity, and then you have a mapping from force to the, the actuator, right, uh, to the pendulum. This cannot be zero. And what was happening was that when it was, it was horizontal, it was actually becoming zero, so there was no input. In fact, the sign changes when it goes from up to down. So it was applying torque in the negative direction. So that's why it was moving away, right? So this is the key. You cannot be really far away from zero. Right? And at zero, it should be non-zero. So this is what we need to have. So we need to have additional assumptions like what I said. Uh, and what is a Lyapunov function? As it turns out, I can use the same inertia matrix. And this is actually the shell complement of this matrix. And as it turns out, if this is positive definite, its shell complement is indeed positive definite. So this is the Lyapunov function can be made positive definite by using this term. So this was one of the main contributions in the paper, right? I'm able to determine the Lyapunov function for the reduced coordinates for only theta, right? And I got it from the big matrix, the bigger matrix. So I'm not worried about the convergence of the entire system because unfortunately it's not possible in this case. But for that particular pendulum link, it is possible. By picking this Lyapunov function, I can show that it is convergent. So I can establish boundedness subject to additional assumptions on the zero dynamics, which is what I will show. Yes. Hmm. It will not go to zero, but then it will oscillate around that region. And yes, it is actually doing it because it's a PD control, right? So if it is going this direction, it will try to pull it back. That direction will force it forward. Well, you can apply forces forward and backward, but then because of its inertia, it will keep on going forward. So, so there are forces acting in, acting in the opposite direction. It's just that it's not making it stop and going the other direction, right? Any other questions? I hope it's clear so far. Okay. So if I, if I am able to write this in state space form, so I have the output dynamics. So this is corresponds to theta. Note that G cannot be zero. And then I have the passive dynamics, which does not depend on the input, right? And the assumption on this is that the solution Z of T is forward complete. So the solution to the zero dynamics is forward complete for all T. With this assumption, I can actually show that I can pick a large enough epsilon and K. So I have put K here instead of two. Uh, to make it more generic. So I have, all I need to do is pick a large enough K and epsilon and a small enough neighborhood for the initial states. So if I'm staying very close to where I want to be and I also pick large enough Ks, I'm okay. I can still have convergence to an ultimate one. Yes. Um, If it is, 
um, well, uh, proving it, I don't know. Uh, but the, what you can do is, you know, instead of simply trying to reach to that set point, there is a trajectory where the end of the trajectory is that set point. And if you try to track that trajectory, then you can avoid throwing the R to infinity. So did you get my point? Yeah, so that is a, uh, that, so that's, so there are ways to keep it vertical. So, oh, so you gave a reinforcement learning approach to, yeah, so you can do left and right. Yes, it is possible. So there are techniques, there are also trajectory based techniques to keep it vertical. Uh, so I just, yeah, I just picked an example. So I simply applied a PD control law and then observed so the, here the point was to observe what will what is going on so there are ways to keep it vertical but not by using this control i don't think it is really possible by using this control but yeah instead of having a constant q desired let's say you have q desired as a function of time right or theta desired as a function of time right you want the pendulum to assume a certain trajectory and the end of the trajectory is perfectly vertical so maybe that will give you stable zero dynamics or you can also think of it this way. Uh, if you add damping to the card, if you add some additional dynamics to the card, if you actually add damping to the card, there are ways to stabilize it. So what I'm actually saying is, you know, if the zero dynamics is stable, then you can actually apply this PD controller and you're fine. Because here zero dynamics was, you know, not stable. I will not say it is unstable. It is not stable. Uh, we cannot say anything about uh, the stability of the entire system. Yes. Yes, yes. Yes. Not really, because uh, if the force is zero, it will keep on going forever at constant velocity. So, yeah, you cannot, you will have to apply a negative force and then to a certain amount so that it actually stops. That's the only way of for how we can do it. Otherwise, it will keep on going at constant velocity. And that is not a stable zero dynamics, actually. OK. So good. So I have got some good number of questions, which means that you guys have understood to some extent. OK. So let me talk about the, the main meat of the, the work. It's actually, for hybrid systems, uh, not only underactuated systems. And I'll take the example of a walking robot. So here is an example of an underactuated hybrid system, like what I said. There is no actuator here, and that's why QU is unactuated. So it's an underactuated system where QU is not actuated. So I have a similar form. Uh, but the trajectories that I'm going to apply, the goal is to have stable walking. So in other words, the entire system has to be stable in this case, not like the cart that I showed. So I, I have actuations here stance knee and non-stance knee, stance hip and non-stance hip, right? So I have four actuators here, and then one unactuated variable. The goal is to come up with a trajectory for these four in such a way that, so now this, now I come actually coming to, I'm coming to the trajectory-based approach. I track a trajectory, and then I try to achieve stable walking in this robot, right? So I have QA, so I'll call QA as a set of actuated joint angles, which are these four. And then I have a desired trajectory, now, I will not make it a function of time for several reasons. So I'll actually make it a function of QU, which is unactuated, right? Uh, one reason is, you know, when you take a step like this, right, it's always in an interval, QU, and it is monotonically increasing, right? So it's a good replacement for time. So now I have a perfectly state-dependent uh, desired trajectory, and the goal is to track it. Why is this powerful? Let's say I stand in front of the robot, right? And then I stop, stop the robot. Let's say I hold the torso of it. QU freezes, QD freezes, right, correspondingly. And the whole robot is like this, still, right, like this. And then I let it go and it'll continue walking, right? So it's actually a reactive mechanism, right? So I'm, by including feedback, I'm making it robust, right? Preventing it from falling. 
which which makes it very elegant. So I have actuation, actuated joint angles, stance knee, non-stance knee, stance hip and non-stance hip. I have desired trajectories, so I have the four polynomials in this case. Now polynomial is a function of QU, like what I mentioned before. So I can pick any polynomial. It has to have enough sufficient order, sufficient power. So the goal is to make this track this, right? So let's say the tracking error was zero, right? QA perfectly tracks QD, right? Now the result of that, like I said, you have zero dynamics, right? So in this case, I have hybrid zero dynamics. Not only that, I have to also make sure that, you know, the jump from here to here also happens on the surface. If the tracking error was zero here, there is a jump because of the impact, the tracking error should continue to be zero. And there are several conditions that you will have to take care of. So this becomes an opti offline optimization problem. But what's interesting is that, you know, this is only for one step, right? So Q is reset. So when I swing the leg, I hit, now this leg will be QU, right? So I swap the legs. Now also means that I'm swapping QU. So I'm transferring it to here, right? So I keep on doing this in every walking step. So the point here is that, you know, I'm actually repeating this trajectory from start to finish in every step. Think of it as a periodic trajectory, right? Where QU repeats from start to finish. So now I have a periodic trajectory, right? In other words, the goal is to find a, st a stable periodic orbit. More importantly, you know, the goal is to find a stable periodic orbit in the hybrid zero dynamics. And as it turns out, it is actually possible to obtain exponentially stable periodic orbit in the hybrid zero dynamics. There are ways to do it. So this is actually a standard offline optimization based approach where you determine Q desired in such a way that you have a stable periodic orbit in the hybrid zero dynamics, right? So this is clear. So, and the way that I obtained was, so, so this is a five degree of freedom robot, robot. Actually, this is called Amber one. So, so we managed to get a stable periodic orbit in the hybrid zero dynamics. And the goal was to apply PD control on this robot. So let me go through the equations briefly. I know you have seen this before. Uh, so instead of QU and QA, I have QU and E, right? So I have done the simple change of coordinates, right? So again, when I do the manipulation, I get the, exactly the form that I showed before for the card, right? So you have inertia, share complement form, you have Coriolis and you have the gravity and they, you have the mapping. So this cannot be zero, right? I gave you the intuition previously, right? And this is a shared complement form. More importantly, I can design E in such a way that I can design the desired trajectory in such a way that I can have diagonal dominance of this matrix. This actually helps in simplifying the proof significantly. And by using this, and using the same Lyapunov function which I showed before, uh, I can establish ultimate borderness of the continuous dynamics. But like I said, this is not enough, right? I can have ultimate boundedness in the continuous dynamics. I can drive it to a very small error in the continuous dynamics. It's not over yet because it's a hybrid system. So to tell you the reasons why, so look at this Lyapunov function. It's exponentially decreasing. There's an impact, there is a jump, right? So the impacts are throwing it away from zero, right? This can happen. Uh, this, this happens a lot in hybrid systems. And the technique that is used is by actually playing with the convergence rate, right? So this reference, you know, actually used a model-based controller and then used a played with the convergence rate. So what I did was I made this simple extension. As it turns out, you can actually play with epsilon here to play with the convergence rate, right? Like I said, right, it has to be the square of the derivative term. So epsilon, increasing epsilon increases the convergence rate. And by doing this, I can actually achieve convergence despite the impacts. But there is a small catch here. This reference talks about uh, convergence to zero, right? Does not talk about convergence to an ultimate point. We also have to worry about, care about reducing the ultimate point because impacts also affect the ultimate bond, right? And this is what I did. So I used, so a lot of the details are given here actually. This is actually inspired by ISS, my PhD work. You can play with the ultimate bond also by simply playing with the game. So think of it as one stone, two birds kind of a thing. You increased epsilon to increase the convergence rate and also to reduce the ultimate bond. And to prove it is, was, it was a little involved, but you can show that, you know, by increasing epsilon, like, right? you know, for example, epsilon equals four, six and 10, right? You can see that the convergence rate is increasing, right? So, and not only that, the bond is also decreasing. 
Also notice that you know here in this case the blue term after every impact is increasing right. So you know this epsilon was not sufficient. So the epsilon had to be more than 4 obviously to bring it down to a very small ultimate bond. So with this you can establish stability of the entire walking robot. So if, so this is the result. If the hybrid zero dynamics has an exponentially stable periodic orbit, then with large enough PD gains, you can show that the full order system has a, 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 an ultimately bonded periodic orbit. So to get back to the details, uh, to, so going back in history, so you have this result on regulation using PD control in 1981. And then they showed exponential stability in 84 to 87, 88 to 91, they showed it for tracking. But what's interesting was that, you know, all of these are for fully actuated systems, right? So it has been more than 40 years, right? 1981, now it is 2019. What really went wrong? Why didn't they figure out the, the under actuated case? As it turns out, you know, there are several reasons. The one major one is that, you know, zero dynamics was poorly understood, right? Not only for robotic systems, you know, for nonlinear systems in general. It was defined in 1985. And then for hybrid systems, the extension for hybrid systems was done in 2001. Uh, but the key results, rapid convergence and ultimate boundedness. So these are the two results and these are very important to establish it for hybrid system, for PD control. And that's the reason why, you know, this was possible. So this would not have been possible without these four. So this was the point of this slide, right? So this is clear. Okay, so let me conclude. Uh, I established stability of PD tracking control laws for both under actuated and hybrid systems. Uh, with assumptions on the zero dynamics. Uh, and also I would like to bring into context uh, some of the papers that are seen in machine learning. If you look at uh, these papers, guided policy search, generative adversary limitation learning, right? Learning agile locomotion, if you look at the details of these, and if you see the action space, right? It's actually a desired configuration, QD, right? And, you know, people come up with new RL algorithm, for example, and their test example is a walking robot in simulation. I'm seeing a lot of these walking simulations from the learning community for whatever reason. Maybe they think it's a textbook example for testing their algorithms. But what's interesting was that, you know, their action space is always there. It's not current or torque, you know, it's the desired configuration. So which means that they're assuming that, you know, everything else will be taken care of by the simulator, right? So it will be tracked very well. So if you look at the simulator, including Mujoko, they have PD control at the lowest level, right? But then there are no existing results to say that it actually works, right? And this paper actually, you know, creates this bridge. It's the bridge between these two. So with this, I will conclude. Now, I wanted to talk about next steps because I felt it was very important. So I'm getting into safety critical systems. Uh, like I mentioned, right, I worked on this... Uh, burger flipping robots. So safety critical control was very important. And I showed this video also where the drone, you know, this is the geofence and then it has a tendency to get outside because of errors, GPS errors. So you would want to make it more and more conservative, right? So this is not only true here, you know, take this example. So you would like to keep some separation between these two drones, right? So you would want to have some artificial constraint which will separate these two all the time. Uh, you, al you would also like to prevent this from colliding these robots. So there are several applications in this domain. And, uh, you know, I always use optimization-based approaches to address these problems. You know, take, for example, the Lyapunov function that I showed earlier without the cross terms. I take the derivative, but then I, do not, I will not substitute a PD control. Let's say I simply put U. And if notice that U is linear in this expression, right? So it's, it becomes a linear constraint. So the goal is to find that u in such a way that v dot is negative. So if I add this as a constraint in a quadratic program or even a linear program, for example, and if it's feasible, I know that the input that I apply will give me stability, right? So, so this becomes a control Lyapunov function, right? A Lyapunov function is converted into a control Lyapunov function because of the presence of u, right? So I have this optimization problem. I have a stability constraint and I can include other constraints. So this is actually for example, this can be a safety constraint, right? So you want to be inside the geofence, so this would be a safety constraint. So you can include more and more constraints like top saturations, a lot of other things, right? And then 
evaluate this in every time step and get this result. So this becomes a QP based solution, this particular methodology, right? And I've already written some results on robustifying this QP, right? And the way we robustify it is by using several techniques. One of them is something like this, right? You make it more and more conservative. I already showed an image, a video of the drones being conservative, right? So this is one way of doing it. Um, so with this, let me talk about uh, my work at RBC CPS. Uh, I believe this is also very important. Right? This is in collaboration with uh, Sagar, one of the grad students, and Shalab and Bharadwaj. Um, and we have this imitation learning problem. So I talked about this previously, right? So here the goal is to insert the spec inside this hole. Um, we can do direct end-to-end -end learning, but I don't think it goes a long way. Uh, but what we have done is, you know, we have combined generator and impedance control. Impedance control is well known in the robotics community, right? So I'm combining the two here. So this is actually very, very critical to get things to work, right? Being able to use your knowledge from your background, from your history, right? From different areas and combining it with learning based approaches. You get this, right? So here, you know, you have a generator network, right? And then you have some state inputs, uh, the position of the peg. The, the roll and the pitch of the peg, right? So you have to decide if the peg was stuck or not stuck, right? If it is stuck, only then you apply the action. And you apply these actions, AX and AY accordingly. So we have, we are able to successfully achieve peg in the hole by using this technique. So we use expert data and then we try to simply mimic it by using this framework. Uh, but what's more important is that I want to understand more and more of this, right? Uh, and I want to take concepts from control theory. For example, you know, you consider some of the activations with a neural network. We know it is globally Lipschitz, and there is already existing work on establishing the Lipschitz constant of a neural network, right? For example, if it's a ReLU, we know it is globally Lipschitz. And Lipschitz constants are fundamental to control theory, right? Powan will agree to that, right? Lipschitz constants are very critical. And we know it, you know, in and out, inside out. Um, I'm also doing a lot of work on walking robots. So here's actually a recent result uh, submitted to Roman. I gave a talk last week in Delhi. Uh, so again, taking inputs from my background, right? So instead of picking QD as action space, I will choose a Bezier polynomial. So I will pick the trajectory itself from the policy network, right? So in other words, I get the Bezier coefficients that becomes your actions, and then I form the trajectory, right? And then the goal is to track this trajectory by using a PD control law, right? And it works really well. This is one of the many results that we have. So we already we also have turning, we have sidestepping a lot of other behaviors. We are also considering other uh, uh, learning strategies like evolutionary strategies uh, to get this to work. But we have come a long way and we want to continue working in this area. So to conclude, so this will be the last slide. If you have any questions, just let me know. So this is the last slide. Um, so I want to obviously continue combining the two, right? Uh, when you think about it, right? I should control Lyapunov function. U star, right, such that, you know, V dot is negative. You would like it to be negative. You pick the minimum of V dot and the idea is that it is negative. If it is negative, then it is stable, right? You have a Q function, right? You pick the maximum of A, right? So these are all very, very similar, but yet these two are coming from different backgrounds, right? People with the computer science background focus a lot on this. People with the control theoretic background focus a lot on this, right? So the difference is huge because, you know, I mentioned put S comma A here, X comma U here. Even the terminologies are different. And to bridge these two uh, fields is not easy. People here work on discrete space. People here work on continuous space, usually. And not to forget, you know, people are not even talking about continuous time here. You know, it's always discrete time, right? People are not even considering continuous time. And we have been doing continuous time for a long time, right? This is always model-based. This is data-based, right? And this is the key, right? You know, why are we not using data in Lyapunov function perspective? What is going on? What went wrong? Is it because of the gap in understanding these two between these two communities? So these are all very important questions to ask, right? 
what about guarantees of stability? Like nobody knows even more stability from the machine learning community. Why, why are we not talking about stability? Because it's actually very, very important, right? So these are all important questions to ask. And you know, these are all uh, questions you know that I would like to be answered. I know that I will not be able to answer all of them, but at least I will try my level best to at least address some of these, uh, especially data-driven approaches, right? Like model-free com control Yapunov functions, incorporating data in control Yapunov functions, data-driven safety, new area, safe reinforcement learning. You know, it's picking up big time. Uh, you know, think of it this way: I have an optimization problem. I'm running it in real time. I need to include data somehow, right? Especially to improve robustness. So I've done a lot of work on improving robustness. I know PD control are considered robust. So how do I include data somehow? I don't know. Uh, the more I think about it, the more I feel like, you know, learning and control for robotics is its own field, right? You need to have some, uh, you know, sufficient background uh, in that field, especially you know, when I talk about Lyapunov functions, there is a specific structure for robotics system, right? Which is what I showed. I'm sure even for Q functions, there will be a specific structure for robotic systems. Not only that, you know, trajectory optimization, even optimization like real time based optimization, they will have a specific structure. Safety functions, they will have a specific structure. So when I talk about all these things in the context of robotic systems, it will be very unique to it. So with this, I will conclude and uh, I'll simply put the list of collaborators and answer any questions if there are. So thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So that's a concern, I know. Domain of attraction? Uh, no. In fact, I haven't given you more details. As I increase epsilon, I also have to go closer and closer to the desired value. I haven't given this. So in other words, the domain of attraction is also getting smaller and smaller. So domain of attraction, yes, it's a hard problem. And simulations we can do, yeah, we can do some basic checks to get it to work. But I haven't really I haven't really done any proper analysis of domain of attraction. Yes, the control, changing the controller definitely affects the domain of attraction. That I completely agree. That I agree. Oh. So you want to linearize the dynamics of the robot and then establish? Well, that is actually the standard approach to establishing stability of linear feedback loss, right? I did not go in that direction because uh, then it becomes the wrong model, I feel. You know, this is actually, the, the, the model is not changing. It is a robotic system and I'm, applying, and I'm applying a PD control law and I'm establishing convergence. The moment I linearize it, it's a different model. So hartman gorman theorem for exponential stability, yes. But here, I'm not actually showing exponential stability. I'm showing boundedness. Uh, I think there are two different things. So hartman gorman theorem for, I'm not showing, I'm not saying that it is going to zero. I'm saying that it is going into a small bound. And this bound can be shrunk to an arbitrary small value. hartman gorman theorem is, you know, you need to show that, you know, eigenvalues are negative, right? And uh, there are also corner cases when hartman gorman theorem cannot be used, right? So. I, that's a, that, that is, you know, I would say, you know, people dealing with linear systems, you know, want, you know, think, look at it from the linear point of view, right? 
but I feel that you know, like I said, it's a robotic system, and I think uh, linearizing it uh, is going. You know, we are going in the wrong direction. We don't know how to change the model. We use the same model and then show that it is possible to get PD controllers to work on a robot robotic system. So uh, I feel the thinking itself should be different for this type of system. We can use. We are not even. So I used properties of the robotic system, right? Positive definiteness of the inertia matrix, right? Coriolis matrix. They have a certain structure, and let's use of make use of that property rather than the properties of a linear system. So that was my thinking here. Yeah. Yes, yeah, different levels of. So, so when you say hierarchy, the hierarchy includes system identification and then optimization and then tracking. So that, so actually that is the next goal, uh, you know. We would love to do system ID in real time, right? Data based approach. So that's where we talk about data based approaches. But yeah, I haven't done that. So my goal for is here to only establish PD control. But yes, we would, I would love to take a look at it. Uh, that's a good point. Can't establish guarantees, but as long as it is slow, uh, and as long as I'm allowed to keep on increasing the gains, I think it should be fine. And yeah, there are there are saturations which will not let me increase the gains to significantly larger values. So this is state-based uh, switching, or oh, hybrid control. Uh, yeah, the switch here in this case is after, right after the impact, the foot strike. So it is in sync with the foot strike. Actually, the switching happens because the QU switches. I switch it to the other leg. So that's the only switch right now. Yes. It is considered. I have not considered it here is because it's an extra term. Then I have to prove that also. It is possible. And so the next step would be to actually also consider PID. P integral is very important. It's very useful, very powerful. You can probably show asymptotic convergence. You know, even shrink the bonds even smaller. Yes. Okay. Good point. Um, we will have to determine H somehow. Sometimes, you know, the constraints that we use make the optimization problem very infeasible. And, uh, you know, which also means we will have to shape the constraint function accordingly. Uh, you know, people use all these techniques like sum of squares optimization to come up with better constraint functions. That is that will be for walking, so let's say center of mass should not be lower than a certain height. So that is one safety function. Uh, you don't want to breach the limits. You have an arm. You don't want to hit this. So that's uh, a constraint function. So determining this constraint function itself, you know, we have to be very careful because that decides if the optimization is feasible or not feasible. In a lot of the cases, it is feasible, 
when it is not then we try to pick a better function or maybe use the data existing data to come up with a better edge better function we can also use data to come up with a better control input u or i can even you put i know pd control plus a neural network you know and because i know it's globally lipschitz the neural network you know i can simply increase p and d gains to a sufficiently large enough value and still be you know okay with the fact that there is a neural network right because you know i know it's not going to go unbounded because the pd gains will take care of the modernness any other questions